All right, good. Let's do this. We've got to wrap up Plaker. So you read him through cover to cover. What are you thinking now? Are you liking this guy or not? Yeah. Good. I think he's pretty good. But we'll, I'll try to make my case here. I won't get into this. I told you last time there's one loose end I wanted to pick up from last time. And this is on page 130, kind of 129, 130. <clears throat> and this is where um, Plaker is, this is beginning of chapter 8, and he's talking about some modern problems and some of these issues. And he writes this In the Middle Ages, in a universe rich in symbolic meanings, hell appropriately lay at Earth's center, where all the weight of the world's sins could flow to it. Modern readers want to ask, how far would you have to dig to reach hell then? Or are you just talking metaphorically? But to force that choice is to impose our ways of thinking on a very different culture. Similarly, before the 17th century, God could be, in Athanasius' phrase, enclosing all things and enclosed by none, within all according to his own goodness and power, yet without all in his proper nature. All right, now, the point I want to get at here is this. We have to recognize, and this is just a little bit of a digression, but it's important for everything more we're going forward here today. And that's this whole idea of metaphor. When you were in junior high or in high school, you were in an English class and you learned about similes and metaphors, right? And you remember that a simile is a comparison using like or as, and a, compar a metaphor is a comparison without using like or as, where you basically say something is something. So like, the storm is a beast. Okay, that would be a metaphor, right? Okay. Beast, a storm was a, was, a, was a beast or is a beast, so it's just saying something is. Now, the thing you have to recognize, and this is an important concept, is that all language is metaphor. All language is metaphor. Now, this gets into the, the Veltzian hermeneutic stuff, all right? And your whole conceptual signifieds and your conceptual signifiers, you remember the distinction? So a conceptual signified is the thing you're talking about, and the signifier is the label you're putting on it to get the job done. So you can be talking about a dog or a canine, and it's the same thing with different signifiers, but it's the same thing. So whether you say dog or canine, it kind of depends on your language, but it's the same thing, all right? Or you could go with you know, other languages, you know, canine's not the best because we have that in English, but um, like a book, so, or a book, is it a libros or is it a book? What are you going to call it? Or is it a biblius? What are you going to call it? Well, it's a book, and we know what we're talking about. The labels can be different. So the conceptual signifies the thing that you're talking about is that, but the signifiers change. Those signifiers are nothing more than sounds and aspirations from your mouth and hitting the ear and making a connection. And so those are metaphors for something else. You get what I mean? They're not the thing itself. The thing itself is the thing itself. The words are just conveying ideas about that thing. And so all language is metaphor. And it's an important thing to kind of grasp. It's, it's not, we talk about, well, that's metaphorical language. All language is metaphor. So then we have to make choices about the kind of language we're using and what, how we're describing things and what's real. Now, from that basic premise that all language is metaphor, I'm going to go to a much more important concept, and that's the idea of the driving metaphor or the controlling metaphors in a culture. We live right now in the 21st century with a driving controlling metaphor of language which is based on a scientific univocal kind of understanding of things as an empirically based use of language. And we have a come to be taught and assume and just operate as if that's what's real and that's what's true because that's what we're used to. All right, so that's the kind of world we're living in. But it wasn't always that way. Now, I'm going to give you some examples here, and this is going to seem a little bizarre at first, but I want you to start kind of wrestling with this, because I, tr I try to get this communicated in other times, and it's just hard to get this idea across. So I'll, I'll do what I can with this, the, the best I can. What, what is real and what is true? We have the illustration that he gave about hell being at the center of the world because, well, all the sin of the world would go to there. And besides, just, you know, down in the depths, kind of that's where hell belongs. Well, in the Middle Ages, also, if you found a plant and its leaves had, were somehow shaped like an eye or had an eye look to it, what would you assume about that plant? I bet if I would eat this plant, it would be good for my eyes. And they would assume that because they saw a correlation, correspondences between what you saw here in the plant, what you see in, in my, my own eye, and so there's a correspondence. And they would make that kind of assumption and that would be reasonable to them. Now, nowadays we look back and they say, well, that was stupid. You know, it's a ridiculous thing to think. You know, well, you've got to figure out what's really working and why, but, you know, come on. 
it just looks like it, come on. But in the Middle Ages, that would be in absolutely make complete sense and it would be reasonable and it would be a compelling argument as truth. All right. Now, another illustration. If you go to certain cultures in Africa, they still like to tell, and in India, they like to tell these just so stories, the kind that Kip Kipling collected in his um, part of his jungle books, the, the just so stories. You familiar with those at all? Like how the elephant got his long trunk? Familiar with these? Oh, man. You guys, yeah, well, I, I discovered this stuff reading to my kids when they were little. I used to um, lay down on the beds between my daughter's twin beds and would read to them at night. And we started off with Hardy Boys and went through all those, you know, and, and it was really exciting, you know. And then we, then we progressed and we went all the, Nar all the Chronicles of Narnia and we did eventually Lord of the Rings and Swiss Family Robinson, Kipling's Jungle Books, just read it, anything I could get my hands out of that was, they would enjoy. And we would read and read, and it was just a blast every time before they went to bed. But anyway, so just those stories we encountered there. And these are the stories like how the leopard got his spots. And this is where one of these African tribesmen was helping him hide, and he put his fingerprints all over the, the, the leopard, and that's how he got his spots, okay? You get these kinds of stories. And then the story about how the elephant got his long trunk. It's when the alligator grabbed onto it, wouldn't let go, or the crocodile, and he pulled and pulled to get away, and it stretched his nose out, and he got his long trunk. Okay, now, they tell these stories still in many of these places, and they t these are part of the culture of these tribes, these just-so stories. Then an American comes along, or a Western, and says, well, you know, those things aren't, aren't true. And the reaction of the people is not so much as, oh, you're kidding, they're not true, <laughs> as, uh, what do you mean? You're not getting what we're talking about. These stories are true as part of our heritage and our context because they help us understand the interrelation of things and the context of things and how things work and there's truth to these stories. In fact, if the Westerner says, well, no, in fact, the reason the elephant has a long trunk is because this was genetic selection and over a long period of time that nose just got longer and longer and longer because the elephant found out it was pretty cool for being able to cool himself off and blow dust around and pick up logs and so that's why he's got the long nose. It was really, you know, select a, you know, the whole natural selection kind of a thing. So you got two stories. Which one's true? All right. That's an interesting question. Which one's true? And if you're living in a scientifically based world <laughs> with a me controlling metaphor, the empirical scientific metaphor as the controlling metaphor, you of course say the second one's true, the first one's a, a myth. But if you're living in a world which has a poetic kind of understanding of truth and of what's real and how language works and of what things are, then the second one is pathetically shallow and missing the depth of what really is going on in the world. All right, now the third illustration might help you get this the most. You're sitting on a beach in Florida on the Gulf Coast and you're watching the sun go down. And it is just this glorious evening <coughs> and it's beautiful. The sun is spectacular. Greds and oranges and even a little green thrown in there and it's just phenomenal. And you comment to your significant other, wow, what a beautiful sunset tonight. It makes me feel odd to think of God giving me this wonderful gift of the sunset and I feel like I'm just part of his creation and th to know his goodness and to be here. On the, it's just like, wow, you know, I feel small and yet special and it's just, the sunset is a beautiful example of God's care for his creation and his actions in this world. All right? And then your significant other who has an advanced degree in um, astronomy says, well, you know, in fact, this is not a sunset. The Earth is just spinning on its axis, and it looks like the sun's going down, but it's really not. We're just spinning around in space. And all these colors, this really just means there's a lot of dust in the air. And the color of the sun itself is a refraction of the light because of the angles. And, you know, they analyze it all out for you. All right? So which one's true? Which account is true? And you see, you're tempted to say, well, both are. And I would say, I don't know if you both are. It has entirely the question of what's your operating paradigm? And I would make the argument that the second explanation, the accurate one, is actually an impoverished and shallow understanding of the world and is actually a wrong understanding of what they just experienced and that the poetic experience is actually more true and more truthful than the second one because it understands the bigger picture. But now, if you're living in a hardcore scientific worldview like ours, the first one's like, oh yeah, okay, that's nice, poetic, but the second one's probably more real, that's more true. And I would say it's the exact opposite, the exact opposite. Now, the whole reason for this little story and these giving these different vignettes is I want you to learn to recognize that we make assumptions all the time even about what is true. 
and we make those assumptions based on our worldview and on what the world has decided are the rules for truth. Right now, the world in which we're living, the rules for truth are empirically verifiable, scientifically meaningful, repeatable, and all this kind of stuff. Now that world has its advantages. It creates things like cell phones and flat screen TVs and you know, jetliners, which are good or bad depending on your point of view, but it, and medicine and drugs and you know, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of cool stuff come out of that worldview. But if that's all you've got, I would say you have a really shallow, pathetic, flat view of the world. You're missing so much more. So it's a question of realizing that the Weltanschauung or the worldview or, or your Gestalt is so normative, even more than you realize. And it's hard to get this across because you guys are steeped in this world. Since you were little kids, that's all you've known. And all through school, that's what you've been pounded into your head. That's what's true, that's what's real, that's what's real. Then there's this world of metaphysics, which is also true. And we get kind of suspicious of that, because it's not verifiable, it's not, it's not empirical. And we're, so we wonder about that. When in fact, in the Middle Ages, what they knew was the metaphysical realities of God and angels and demons, that they knew. And then whether or not there were really atoms, hey, I'm not sure about that. We've just completely flipped things around. It's so weird to think about how a, a paradigm, a cultural paradigm, takes over and how it controls things. But you need to be aware of that, of how we have come to the point of just honoring and almost revering the scientists because they're real and they're truthful. When in fact, they're just operating in a particular Weltanschauung, a worldview, which norms and guides them. All right. So that's kind of the point I wanted to get across. It's a little bit of a conceptual thing, but it is important for what we're going forward here to realize that uh, our, even our assumption of what, what's real and what's true is colored by a world in great and in, in rather significant ways. So if all language is metaphor, even the language of the scientist is metaphor, it's just that we think his is more accurate because we've all come to agree on what that metaphor means and how it's going to operate. All right, any thoughts or comments there? You guys, you guys getting me on this? Kind of what I'm trying to get across a little bit? Nate, you're not so sure. Question. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so when your friend has a miscarriage mm -hmm. and her friend who says, oh, no, this was because of <coughs> implantation, blah, 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 and your other friend says, no, this is because you sinned. Mm -hmm. Well, what are the mitigating, it seems like we want to draw that line and say, no, 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 this one's wrong. Well, it's, no, see, this gets exactly to his, his, his final chapter, because you're up to, against a the theodicy, which we'll get there in a minute. And I would say that the, um, the better answer would be to say, God's in God, and this really stinks. And either explanation is missing the point. But are there no situations where the scientific explanation actually is more true? Oh no, it's. I would and say we it, want to it, actually use it to say, no, bad, stop that. Well, if I'm, I'm trying to treat a cancer, I might want to go with the scientific worldview right. sometimes. Or if I'm um, trying to figure out how to get my car to stop, I'd probably you know trust the brakes and you know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the scientific worldview definitely has its advantages at certain times. Now more on that when we get to the last chapter though, because you're on the you're on, you're asking the questions which we're going to be exploring here more thoroughly, Stephanie. How can, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but how can we say something is more or less true? Just, <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, the, the problem comes down to what are your parameters for truth? And that's kind of the point I'm making. And the, my argument then is that the, even the worldview you choose has its rules about truth. And we, we don't like that. But the very fact that the, your question itself is, is expressing a modernist worldview. You, you, see, you, you don't see what I, yeah, I can't you, you, it. No, no, you, exactly my point. You can't escape it. Because you're very, wait, wait, well, what's true? See, that's the question a modernist is going to always ask. Well, wait a minute, what's true? And the point Plaker's trying to make, and the point I'm trying to make is truth is actually dependent upon your assumptions going in and the worldview you choose and the worldview in which you are going to operate. That's going to determine truth. And so it's not quite as clean cut as we want. And this, this is, has a big implications even within the church, because church people get worked up all the time about, well, what's truth? We need to know what's truth. And you say, oh, you know, and then they look like they think you're fudging and kind of playing games with them. But in fact, the reality is truth is very much dependent upon your understanding of the worldview in which you're living. Now, what we're trying to make sure people have is a worldview based on God's revelation. 
And within that revelation, there is truth, and that would be Christ himself. I am the way and the truth and the life. So what's truth is Christ and his story. That's what's true. Beyond that, I'm not always sure. Which makes it sound like, wow, that's really, you know, <laughs> non-foundationalist. But in a sense, yeah, it is non-foundationalist because the foundation needs to be on Christ. That's the truth. So Go ahead. Are, are you familiar with the, the elephant story of like different people that are like blindfolded touching the elephant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Um, I've kind of lost This is a great story, Dave. We had a story in chapel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so I it's, tell it's, a, story. It's, like, it's like a rope, it's like a snake, it's like a tree, it's like a. Yeah, but there's always, there's always that one interpretation. thing ab above, which is God that knows the one right. truth. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, does that apply to what we're talking about right now? Or? In many ways, yes. <laughs> because, you see, what we're doing is we are humans approaching this world and we're approaching this revelation, and then we're trying to determine what it is and determine meaning. And the point of hermeneutics is that every interpretation is coming from a context, and that context you're aware of sometimes, sometimes you're, sometimes you're not. But it's got a context, and that context absolutely shapes what you interpret and what you determine as truth and what is right. And that context is really important. The, the one of the good gifts of postmodern, uh, postmodernism, if you want to call it that, or postliberal or whatever, you know, the Plaker's world, is that we are being compelled to think a little more carefully about our context going in. Why are we thinking what we're thinking? Why do we make the assumptions we're making? And now it's hard to see that because we, we are so in, embedded in it, you can't even really see it because you're just used to it. It's just your world. It's the way it is. And when people start saying things like, well, that's just the way it is, it's like, well, you're going, okay, you don't get it. Um, but that's, that's kind of the point. Okay? okay? Good questions. Okay. Yeah, no, you're, 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 sh you're showing that you're thinking about which is what I want. So you're, 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 you're wrestling with this. That's good. Nathan? Tim Keller points out that that actual story is like the paradigm of modernity because you have a sixth character, which is the narrator who sees all and sees everyone who assumes that their position is the one that sees truth as the ultimate. Is. You can't even tell that story without already reinforcing your own modernist. I can actually see all your... I can, all, I can see all of your bad interpretations, and so you're actually a modernist telling this postmodern story. But you're not actually... Exactly. exactly. And that's, and that's why... Later. Right. And that's why Plaker and so many of these postmodernist theologians are suspicious of this postmodernist label. They, they really don't buy it because it's still kind of modernity doing its thing. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. All right. Go ahead, Mike. I'm just linking, if we're going to keep telling that story. <laughs> oh, good. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> the only one who sees the elephant, quote unquote, if there is an elephant, you know, is God. Mm. And we don't have any access to what he sees. All right. We so have our assumption that we can figure out the elephant if we just try hard enough is exactly what Plague is trying to get at. That, that this is ridiculous. That's you right. You can't take God's viewpoint. That's right. And any attempt to do so is doomed to failure. Right. And so accept the fact that you've got the leg and that's all you've got and shut up about it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> to, you know, let's, let's, let's just kill this metaphor. Let's go all the way. Then we'll kill the elephant. Um, the, yes, that's true. And yet, as humans who are living in this revealed world of God, we do want to think about it and comprehend it as much as we can and learn about it because it is in our, in, is in our actual thinking and learning and striving to understand this world that I would argue we're actually honoring and worshiping the Creator as we're thinking God's thoughts after him. So we do this, but, and this is a critical move you're making, and I would reinforce what you, your point is, we do this with a sense of humility and of um, our own awareness of our inadequacy. We're not going to be able to pin it down. We're not going to be able to have the definitive answer, but we're going to do it anyway. Now, I would say that doesn't squelch the scientific enterprise, but encourages it but it keeps it in the right bounds. And the problem with modernity is it's going into this with this heady kind of optimism that we're going to figure it out because we don't need God anymore. Whereas the Christian is going to say, we're going to figure things out as much as we can because what a blast to try to discover this world that God's created, but we're never going to get it all figured out. That's okay. Let's have fun in the process. And if we start with the leg, maybe we can work our way up to the, to the trunk and we'll figure out something else or the tusk and we'll you know, make a little further progress. We'll do what we can. And, and you do what you can, but you don't ever make the assumption that, hey, we got it all pinned down. All right, now, back to Plaker then. Let's get cranking here. We've got an hour to wrap everything up. Um, chapter 9, we don't need to spend a ton of time with. I want to make sure I have enough time for that last chapter because that's the really significant <laughs> one here. Now, in chapter 9, he's kind of reprising what he, he, and he admits this, he's picking up one of the things he did back in chapter 6 where he was talking about how grace gets compromised, and he's kind of going a little further here, but his point is now things are actually getting kind of solidified into theories and into doctrines, and it's no longer kind of just, you know, abstracts, but it's actually happening, and he's following the same three threads. Remember the three threads he's always following are... 
Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed. All right. So where does he start with this chapter? He starts with Melanchthon. So Lutherans get first billing this time, and he's telling the story here about Melanchthon and the problem of synergism. Since you haven't yet had Systems 3, you haven't had this big discussion, or even Systems 2. And this is always the frustrating thing, because we have to kind of do things as we can. Synergism is a term most of you all know. You all pass your ELCE for systematics, or you wouldn't be here. And so you know what synergism means, right? Yeah. Means cooperation. cooperation, literally to work together with. You just take the Greek apart, sin ergo, to work with. Synergism is always in contrast to a term you might not be as familiar with, which is divine monergism, which is another term you will learn next quarter for sure. Divine, well, you've learned it now. Divine monergism means that God only does the work. God alone does the work. Divine monergism. Divine monergism describes our understanding of salvation, right? Why are you saved? Because God saved me. God alone does the work. What role do you play in that? Nothing. You're good Lutherans, you know the answer. Nothing. God does it all. That's what grace means. And synergism then is the enemy of divine monergism. So, when Luther was teaching his theology, which were, where did he come down? Synergism or divine monergism? Yeah, obviously divine monergism. And what Plaker wants to argue is, so did Calvin. Well, that's pretty easy to see with Calvin. I mean, a full blast kind of Calvinist tulip kind of a thing, which we'll talk about because we haven't done that yet either. So we'll get to there. And so Calvin's doing that. And he says even Aquinas, which some Lutherans say, oh, I don't know about Aquinas. But he would say no, because Aquinas is recognizing God has to make the move. God has to give the grace. God does it all. Divine monergism. All right? And we don't need to get into those nuances. We'll talk about that next quarter with the role of the will and all that kind of stuff. The point now is, though, that so Luther is doing a divine monergism. And then comes Melanchthon. And Melanchthon makes the point, this is the bottom of... Um, the end of footnote on 147. Thus rightly understood is true and will make clear this com combination of causes, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the will. So in other words, Melanchthon is saying that there are three causes in the conversion of a sinner. The Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the will. Now, this is problematic. At least it seems like it. Uh, a lot of this depends on how you read Melanchthon. And I don't want to get in a long kind of sidetrack here because this could become really consuming. But, and maybe you get this in your your history courses already. There are those who hate Melanchthon and then those who are sympathetic towards Melanchthon. I'm in the latter category. I like Philip. And I think he was invaluable. He made great contributions to the Reformation and was an incredibly um, significant part of the, the work of the church. So I like Philip. Now, there are others who don't have a lot of use for him because they think he sold out the Reformation <laughs> on all kinds of different things. Now, Philip made some missteps, but on this score, the synergism thing, I'm not sure if this charge even sticks. Now, it sounds like it. There are three causes, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the will. Wow, the will is a cause in your salvation? But what I would say is I think Philip is really just kind of doing Aristotelian stuff. And what Philip is saying is, if you're going to have a conversion, you have to have a will to be converted, don't you? And so that would be the material cause. You've got to have that, and without that, there's no conversion. And if that's all Philip is saying, he's not really guilty of synergism. But there are other times when Philip said things that he shouldn't have said. And did he step in it on occasion? Yes, he did. Philip had this tendency to want to over-philosophize things. And his Aristotelianism got the best of him from time to time when he would go a little too far and got into trouble. And we see this happening in the other threads, too. So I'm not trying to whitewash Philip. I'm just saying I'm not ready to throw him out, either. And there are some people who actually, I've read this, they even question his salvation, which is absurd to me. But, you know, people get kind of nutty when they start going, getting carried away and, wow, Philip's a synergist. I don't really know if I want to categorize him there. Now, Plaker's going to do this. He's going to make this move. But it gets more clear when we go to the other threads. So then he talks about Philip. And then he goes to the Catholics and talks about Molina. But then we get to the Calvinists. And the Calvinists are the easiest to tell their story with because they're the most familiar. And what we have then is we've got Calvin's thread. And with Calvin, we have his immediate successor, which is this guy named Beza. And Beza is the one who really starts to systematize and categorize things and push things. And then we get these Confession of Dort and the Westminster Confession or the Synod of Dort. And what we finally get from Beza is what we know as the full blast tulip Calvinism. And if you grew up in southwest Michigan or in some parts of California where Calvinists still run rampant, you maybe know something about this. But maybe you don't. And so I'm going to give you your first introduction to tulip Calvinism. TULIP, Calvinism, TULIP is an acronym for total depravity, that's the T, and then U, which is 
unconditional <coughs> election. And then we have the L, which is a limited atonement. And then the I, which is irresistible grace. And then finally, the P, which is perseverance of the saints. All right, so that's your tulip Calvinism, all right? Total depravity. Total depravity means man has completely crushed sin, abject in his, in his sinfulness. Unconditional election, God has chosen those who will be saved, and it's a done deal, un unconditional. And, of course, Calvinists would say, and he has therefore also decided who will not be saved. And so from the time that you are conceived, even before that, it's already decided whether you're going to be spending an eternity in, in joy and bliss or in hell. Done deal. All right, that's unconditional election. Limited atonement is, why would Jesus bother dying for those who are going to hell? He didn't. He died only for the elect. So there's a limited atonement. Irresistible grace is, once God decides you're his man, you're his man. You can't say no. He makes the claim, he's got you. You can't say no to him. And then perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved. Once you're in, you're in. All right, so that's classic, full blast, tulip Calvinism. This is what was being taught by Beza. How common is this stuff anymore in the American context? It's around. I would argue you've got to look pretty hard to find it. You've got to look pretty hard to find it. Now, here's the reason why. What kind of God do you get when you start thinking about this? What's God look like? Puppet master. Puppet master. Transcendent judge. Transcendent judge. He, is he transcendent here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But nice? What's with this creating people for hell thing? What's with that? And not only the nice problem, you got scripture that says God wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, which they would say, well, you know, there's that revealed will of God, then there's the secret counsel of God. And that's when that really matters. And you wonder where that is in the Bible, but that's what they hang on to. Now, this is what Beta starts teaching as a successor of Calvin. Then along comes one of his contemporaries, a guy named Jacob Arminius. And this is the story that gets interesting. And Arminius says, wow, that's a really nasty looking God. So it's not really good for evangelism or mission outreach. How, you know, <laughs> not the easiest way to do things. And it's not. You know, if, you're really, if you really are a full-blown tulip Calvinist, why do you bother doing evangelism? I mean, so if I sit on my couch and do nothing, is God going to get his man? Yep. He has to. He's already decided. So whether I do it or not, what does it matter? In fact, the only real reason they can give for doing evangelism is so that you can be faithful because God told you to. So I've got to do what I told, told to do, whatever it means. And you have other problems with the Calvinism, too. You have big problems like, how do you stand in front of a congregation and say, I forgive you your sins. They're all forgiven in the name of Christ. I can't. I can say, if you're one of the elect, your sins are forgiven. But if you're not, sorry, they're not forgiven. Because Jesus, in fact, didn't die for them. Tough. Now, that creates another big problem. The problem of, am I one of the elect? And that's where the issue gets really interesting. Because this becomes a big question of, how do I know if I'm in the elect? And the answer they gave was, do you see the Holy Spirit in action in your life? That's how you know God's in you. Whew. It's all good, which is great, so long as all the good works are rolling. But when the temptations are severe, and the good works seem to get a little thin, or a little dry, and the connection isn't seeming so strong, well, then what? Where do I go for comfort? <laughs> there isn't any. And if you have ever known a real full-blown tulip Calvinist, and spending any time with them, you've probably seen evidence of this kind of struggle. Because it's palpable. Nate? That's why I'm a Lutheran. That's why you're a Lutheran. All right. There we have it. Living testimony. Now, this to Arminius was unacceptable. And so Arminius said, no, 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 no. God's not like that. God wants all to be saved. He loves us all. And in fact, the reason that some are saved and some aren't is because some people are just bigger idiots than others. And some people have a little spiritual inclination and they say yes to God. Other people say no to God. And so man has the choice. So man gets to choose. All right. Now, in terms of divine monergism and synergism, where's Arminius coming down? Synergism. synergism. Absolutely. So man gets to choose. That's a synergist move, so he's making the same kinds of moves as the other synergists. The bigger argument for Plaker's point is this. Because all this discussion about the rise of synergism and this whole total depravity stuff, he says, is all indicative of a bigger problem. And that bigger problem is that still the issue I introduced to you last time of playing the zero-sum game. 
all right? Or what we also called last time contrastive transcendence, or the whole idea of you know, transcendence as or imminence, the contrastive transcendence imminence, which one is it? Now, how, this is going to be relatively easy, how does Arminius reflect a zero-sum game mentality? Yeah. God comes and sends Jesus. He dies on the cross. He rises from the dead. He accomplishes everything. Now, your part is simply to receive that and to believe. And if we're going to do ratios, maybe God's part is 98 and your part's a 2 percenter. Or maybe we can even go stronger. God's is like a 99.99 and you're like 0 .001 and, you know, that's your part. And God does all the rest. How cool is God? And, but we're still doing a synergism thing. And more importantly, we're playing a zero-sum game. Now, the interesting thing is that Plaker argues is, so is Batesa playing a zero-sum game. How's he playing a zero-sum game? Yeah, God does it all. You do nothing. Because, you see, it's limited atonement, congregational election, irresistible grace. You don't do anything. God just grabs you, you're it, that's it. And you have nothing to do with it. And so, if a full-blown Calvinist would say, yeah, the guy who goes to hell, he goes to hell because God chose him to go to hell. That was it. And Arminius says, no, man makes the choice, and so they're both playing the zero-sum game. They're both playing the zero-sum game. So what's the right way to think about this? We'll spend a lot more time on this next quarter, but I don't want to leave you hanging for months. So we'll just cut to the chase here and give you the bottom line real quick. The right way to handle this is what we, we're into what we call the crux tailagorum, which you'll deal with more next quarter. And that's the question of why some and not others. What's going on here? And the right way to handle this is to say this. God does the electing, absolutely. And he does it all. It's divine monergism. And yet, man is always held responsible and accountable for what he does with God's call. And so man can resist. We sometimes say that man has a half free will. He can resist. He can't choose to say yes, but he can absolutely reject. And he, so we reject the irresistible grace. We don't agree with that. In fact, we would agree with limited to total depravity in some ways, and even unconditional election if you take it as a one-sided thing, that God has chosen those he will have. Limited atonement, we disagree with that completely. Irresistible grace, we reject that. And perseverance of the saints, we'll even accept that to a point. God's not going to let go of you. And he's not going to change his mind about you, but you, because of your responsibility as a human, can thwart God's purposes and reject what he is offering. So in other words, God won't throw you out or drop you, but you can climb up and jump out of his hand. And so, because you're, you're responsible. So what we're doing is, and our Lutheran answer is, we're trying to hold on to two things at once. We're trying to hold on to the reality that God does it all, and yet man is completely, entirely held responsible and accountable. So the question is, well, then what's the ratios there? And what's the answer? The answer is 100%, 100%, which doesn't add up. So in other words, what happens to the zero-sum game? That's gone. And that's precisely the point Plaker's trying to make. That if you try to play the zero-sum game, you end up either in a total depravity kind of, I mean a tulip kind of answer, or you end up in an Arminius kind of answer, and that's what you're left with if you're playing the zero-sum game. But if you're going to be faithful the way Luther was, you don't play the zero-sum game. You just state both things and leave it alone. That's the point. Ryan. Um, in Confessions, I remember, I don't know if this is right, but um, Dr. Cole brought up the idea that it's almost impossible to think about this outside of law and gospel. Is that? No, there's, that, I would think that, that's true. Like when you talk about law, it's more our responsibility, but when you talk about gospel, it's, I don't know, maybe he just didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's probably accurate. Um, we're going to spend more time on this next quarter. That's why I'm just I'm trying to give this a little bit short shrift right now, quite frankly, because I don't want to get bogged down in this, because this becomes a, a really sticky issue and we spend a long time on it. I don't want to get all, all weighted down at this. What, we, what you need to recognize is that even this move to try to solve the crux telegorum is driven by this kind of um, zero-sum game thinking. And what it's really driven by, and see this is what Plaker's argument is, it's driven by a modernist idea that we have to make this make sense. It's got to make sense. And tulip Calvinism makes sense. Arminius makes sense. What we teach doesn't make sense. And that's really the bigger issue. Um, I'm also convinced, you know, in answer to your question, Ryan, that um, this issue is not a sort of side little issue that you kind of don't talk about because it's kind of, kind of hard and kind of embarrassing and kind of confusing, so don't talk about it. I disagree with that completely. I think this issue is, is central to the whole concept of Christian faith and has to be talked about. 
And so, and I think it is law, gospel, two kinds of righteousness, all these things impinge on this. I think what Cole was saying was like, outside of application, it's really difficult to nail down, but when you're actually talking to someone, it's a lot easier to nail And this down. is Plaker's point as well. When we try to schematize these things or try to put them into some kind of a theory, we get into trouble. And that's where Beitzer gets into big trouble. That's when Arminius gets into big trouble. What's much easier is to deal with people on an ad hoc sort of basis. Let's deal with what's going on here with your situation, and let's talk about what needs to be talked about. Do we need to emphasize the personal responsibility, the divine monergism, because both are true? You need to know. And that you as the pastor, the deaconess caregiver, you're the one who sorts out what needs to be done. And then um, another question is a little different, but uh, Luther almost seems to talk in a couple of these sections. You know, he's going to say, well, you're always freely choosing, you're freely choosing, but God almost like steps back a notch and will actually like use your freely choosing for his His will and his purpose, which at sometimes just seems like equivocation to me and still kind of leads to the same road of double predestination. Well, that's not really what Luther is saying. What Luther is saying is that God, God when you read bondage of the will, God is far more sovereign than we think he is. Um, and that's why the Calvinists love bondage of the will. They, they translate it. In fact, the translation I recommend for you guys to use is a, is a, is a Calvinist translation. And they love him. Um, Lutherans are usually embarrassed by it and don't talk about it very much. Um, but what's instructive is to remember that Luther said at the end of his life that was the one book he said should be kept. He liked it. And he still liked it 25 years later. So you can't just say, well, Luther changed his mind. Well, no, he didn't. Uh, that, that's his position, and he was rather really firm on it. And so what you get in the bondage of the will is, is an absolute sovereign God who is completely in control, completely in control. And yet, and yet, a man who is still held accountable, who can't hide in God's, well, if God did it all, then I'm, I'm powerless. No, you're not. And see, and that's the kick. And that's why it's really vital to get this to be able to understand what's going on here. Because all of these are just falling into the zero-sum game, and the right answer refuses to be boxed by the zero-sum kind of mentality. That's, that's the real point. All right, so let's click along here. Page 159. <clears throat> Page 159, and he's talking about the whole um, federal theology, which is another version of this kind of Arminian thing, or this, the kind of um, covenant theology. And so the top of page 159, we, write, we read this. The moral quality of one's life witnesses to one's faith, which is the condition of one's justification. Having adopted the model of divine and human agency operating on the same level as competing forces, okay, zero-sum game, Rutherford insisted that while we are, as it were, patients in obeying gospel commands, we are not mere patients, since in gospel obedience we offer more of the Lord's own and less of our own. The relation between human and divine contributions has become a zero-sum game, and thus the power of grace is finally the enemy of human freedom. You see, that's, that's the real rub here in this whole chapter. If we're going to play a zero-sum game, then we've got a choice. It's either human freedom, which is what Arminius wants, or it's really completely divine grace, which is what Tulip Calvinism is trying to talk about, even though people try to caricature this as a scary God. You've got grace going full blast here. So what saves you? Purely God's choice. What do you have to do with it? Not one darn thing. That's grace. And frankly, on that score, that's Lutheran. We're all about that. Grace is grace. There's nothing in you that God likes. There's nothing in you that God sees that is, is attractive to him. He just says, you're the guy. I choose you. Why? <sighs> Don't ask. He just did. That's, that's grace. And that's why I asserted last time that you hear at, and at Reformation, everybody always talks about, oh, I love grace. Grace is wonderful. You, know, you don't even know what you're talking about. Because if you really get a handle on grace, you realize it kind of diminishes you. And people who are really big into their self-esteem don't really get grace. Because if you're trying to preserve your self-esteem, grace is completely antithetical, antithetical to that. It's that whole theology of glory, theology of the cross thing. The cross just kills you. Grace just lays you low. You're dead. You've got nothing. You're pathetic. You're worthless. God loves you anyway. Whew, that's good news. That's grace. That's grace. It's offensive. It's really offensive. And that's the heart of it. So, but if you're going to have human freedom preserved or divine grace, how do you reconcile them? Zero sum game, you start getting into percentages. A little of this, a little of that. How's it going to work out? How are we going to play this thing out? See, then, because Arminius is a, is a synergist. He's somewhere in between. Way over here, we could have a Pelagian. What would a full-blown Pelagian believe? You've got to save yourself. 
and you got to work it out. You got to do your thing, and it's all your job. And then when you get done, God will look and see how you did. And if you did, if you did it right, you're in. What part did God play? Well, not much. That's you know that's the other extreme. So you got full-blown Calvinism one extreme, Pelagianism on the other hand, and then somewhere in between all this synergistic stuff and all these different varieties. And synergists come in a wide variety. Stephanie. Um, so last class period we talked about arriving at a conclusion like based on the biblical narrative and the yes. economy of salvation rather than the word. It seems like um, the way that we would conclude this is Lutherans were relying on the word pretty heavily to kind of divulge this information about how sure. we're saved. So because, yeah. is there any way in the economy though that we know this to be true? Well, see this is the part of this relationship. That's where we're going with the next chapter. The relationship between the Bible and the economy of salvation is because we know Christ has come for us and we trust what he's done, he points us to the veracity of his written text and we trust that as well. The problem, see, I'm not ever trying to diminish the significance of the Bible. And we can base doctrine on the Bible. Don't get me wrong on that. But we have to be careful that we don't base our faith on the Bible. In other words, we are basing our faith on what Christ has done, and then we hang on to the Bible because we trust in Christ. Christ is first, the Bible is second, not the other way around. That's the critical thing. But the Bible is absolutely imperative for norming our doctrine, shaping our doctrine, and helping us develop it. Sure. All right, chapter 10. And anything else on 9? All right, this chapter we can go quickly because this is this, this whole marginalization of the Trinity. This one should be really familiar to you because he's actually quoting Lacuna. And what is the point that Plaker makes in this chapter regarding Lacuna? She says it's the 4th century problem. Well, maybe. I think it's a 17th, 16th century problem. And we'll just agree to disagree. It's kind of what Plaker is saying. He's not going to take Lacuna on and argue that when did things really go wrong with the Trinity. He's just making a point that you can see some big mistakes that got made in the, sec in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I think, I think Plaker's got a good case to make. So he's not disparaging Lacuna. He's just saying maybe there's a little more to it than that. That's kind of what he's, he's saying. Because he, remember, his agenda is that things went wrong after the pre-moderns, after the rise of Descartes, and after the rise of modernism. That's when things started going bad, and that's his, his argument. All right, now the really kind of cool thing, though, in this chapter is on page 169. Because he's following these three threads again, right? And again, we see the, all three threads, the Calvinist, the Lutheran, and the Catholic, are all making these mistakes. And what's the big mistake? The big mistake is thinking about God less in terms of what he's actually doing in the economy and thinking about God as an abstraction. And the evidence, he says, of this is when God is just kind of thought about first and then the Trinity comes later on. And we start thinking about the Trinity. He says that's problematic. And he gives some interesting moves here. Page 168, and this is where the Bible comes into play. The very bottom of 168, Calvin's Institutes, like the Lutheran Augsburg Confession, began with the discussion of God. Think about it. AC 1, God. 2 is sin. 3 is Jesus. 4 is justification by grace through faith. Where is the article in the Augsburg Confession on the Bible? There isn't one. There isn't one. They didn't need one. It was a non-issue. But there's no article in the Augsburg Confession on the Bible. Nothing there that establishes the Bible as God's word. Nothing that says it's inerrant or infallible. It's not, it's not there. All right, now let's go on here. Calvin then subsequently presented scripture as a gift of the triune God he had already identified. The Westminster Confession, written in the 1640s, however, begins with a chapter on scripture. Of God and of the Holy Trinity comes only in chapter 2. In chapter 1, the word of God consistently refers to the Bible, not to Christ. Much 17th century theology in both Lutheran and Reformed traditions likewise discuss Scripture first and then the triune God. Sound familiar? Pieper. Remember we talked about this already? Pieper has his prolegomena, and he has 150 pages on Scripture, and then at page 260, he gets around to God, which is why you started reading Pieper at volume 1 at page 260. Now, see, it's the same moves going on. It's so the same move is going on. Now, Plaker says, this is not some small thing. Now, here's what, how he built his argument. So, bottom of 169, second full paragraph. Luther's view had been more like Calvin's. The Bible, he said, remained the letter of purely human word unless illuminated by the Holy Spirit. But the 17th century Lutheran theologian Abraham Kalov, like a number of his contemporaries, insisted that the word of God, by which he here meant the Bible, was not an inanimate instrument, but could itself accomplish conversions without the need of the illumination of the Spirit. Both Reformed and Lutheran theologians then began a pattern that continues down to contemporary evangelical theology in which orthodoxy has more to do with beliefs about biblical authority than about Trinitarian doctrine. 
more than that. While such theologians thought of themselves as defending biblical authority in the right face of a rising tide of net rationalism, they were in their own way rationalists. Human reason, Turretin insisted, could figure out the Bible's authority. That authority then served as a foundation for a theology that did not need to appeal in the ways earlier theologians had to the mysteries of grace and revelation. This is huge. This is huge, 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 huge. You see, the move to Scripture away from God is part of this rationalist, modernist move because we want to get something solid, certain, and pinned down. And you see this going on yet today? He hints at this. If you go to an evangelical and he wants to test your orthodoxy, what's he going to ask you about? Evangelical fundamentalist. What's he going to ask you about? Is the Bible inerrant? Was the virgin birth? Was Jesus born of a virgin? And see, it's not an issue of Christology. It's an issue of Isaiah 6. What, Joel? King James. What's your version? And so why does the version matter so much? Because, see, it's the exact words. That's the source of it all. It's the basis. That's the foundation. And you better know which words are the right words. It becomes a big deal. And they get all worked up about this stuff. And you see how rationalistic that is? Because they want to have neat, clean, solid answers and they've got to have a place to go for this. And when you get something sloppy like, well, the Holy Spirit called me. Well, when did that happen? Well, at the baptismal font. Wow, okay. That's when it happened. And how do you know this? Well, because he said so. Where's that in the Bible? Where's your name? Well, you see, it becomes so, so different as this kind of foundation. And what we need to recognize is that this move away from God and the Trinity and his work in the economy and toward the Bible as the, these texts, was a move in a rationalistic direction. And that's precisely one of the reasons why we're trying to reconfigure the curriculum here and try to get away from that sort of a fundamentalistic, rationalistic, modernist way of thinking about where we start and what's the foundation. So the real test of orthodoxy should not be, what's your view of the Bible? The real test of orthodoxy should always be, what's your view of Jesus and what do you think about the Trinity? You ask most fundamentalist evangelicals about the Trinity, they don't know anything about that besides, well, he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but no, not much more than that. And Matthew 28, 19 says we have to believe that. That's about it. And it's not central. And what Plaker's arguing is it needs to be central. It has to be central or we're missing the, the point entirely. So what the, this chapter then becomes for Plaker another example of how the um, modernist move pushed us away from our foundation in Christ and a kind of a pre-modern thing into this wrong foundation. In this case, it's scripture. Okay, further questions on chapter 10. Okay. You, got, you guys tracking with this? Now, why is it such a big deal? It's a big deal because I would be willing to bet that the vast majority of the people sitting in our pews are still fundamentalist Lutherans who think that the Bible is everything. It's the Bible, it's the Bible, it's the Bible, it's the Bible. And all they care about is the Bible. And they don't realize that that's the wrong foundation. And see, even what I'm saying here, if they were hearing me say this, they would probably be freaking out. Well, of course it's the foundation. Well, no, it's not. Christ is. And the confession of Christ and his work in the church, that's the foundation. So how do I know that Christ lived and died for me? Because he claimed to be in baptism. Not because the B-I-B-L-E says so. You don't prove the Bible and then get to Jesus. Jesus claims you and finds you and you have faith and then you say, this Bible is true because I know of my Savior. And he points to me to this word, I can trust this word because it's the word of Christ. It's the word about him. That's why. So the Bible comes second. So in answer to your question, your question earlier, Stephanie, the Bible is absolutely cru crucial, but it's in a secondary role, not the primary one. And that really is what distinguishes a proper Lutheran confession and I would say Orthodox confession from a more evangelical fundamentalist one. All right, you guys are being mighty quiescent today. So either you're just giving up or you think I'm totally out to lunch and don't even want to talk about it. Or we think we have it, but we probably Well, maybe that's the case too. I'll just assume you've all got it down and we're all good here. There's, there's lots of possibilities. I'll go with the most, I'll put the best construction on everything. Yeah, that's merit. Where do we, where do we start then when we're talking to someone that has a Bible foundation yeah. that you know, obviously just walking up and saying, you got the wrong foundation. No, I'm not I, having the explanation, but how do you go about actually shifting well, that? I think you ask questions like, so what saves you? Is it the Bible that saves you? Well, no, it's Jesus. I say, yeah, I think that's right. So if Jesus saves me, maybe I should start there with my faith. And maybe, um, I, maybe Christ actually works in my life and does things, and 
that's his reality. And then the Bible is what confirms and teaches me this. But my faith probably should be more centered around Christ than it should be the Bible, don't you think? That's probably the move I would make. All right. Okay, two more chapters to go. Chapter 11, the image of the invisible God. This is where he's in his last section, part four, he's doing his critical retrievals. So remember he said up front, he's not ready to go back and live as a pre-modern. Remember, he's got his feminist concerns, which start to pop up here again at the end. You guys, I'm sure, caught all that. You know, he's really concerned about bad God talk when women are being put down. So that, his, this stuff starts to come up. But he's trying to make some retrievals. So there are some key points here at the very beginning. It's page 181. So first lesson, a basic lesson, second paragraph. Theologians get in trouble when they think they can clearly and distinctly understand the language they use about God. <laughs> Agreed. Big lesson, you should have kind of figured this out by now. That's the lesson of this book all the way through. When you think you know what you're saying about God, you often get into trouble. Okay, point one, next paragraph. Many theologians came to think of God as one of the entities or agents in the world among the others, and of God's properties as differing from those of created things in degree rather than in kind. If we insist on a clear understanding of our language about God, then we have to think of God's love or power as rather like the love of a human being or the power of a steam engine only greater. Thinking of God in such terms leads to asking where God is and which are the things that God does and attempts to answer such questions in the ways compatible with Christian faith and have often made theology the enemy of science, fighting to preserve a place for the God of the gaps in the face of ever more comprehensive scientific explanations. Now he's touching on a lot of important things here. First thing is we recognize again the great error in thinking about God on a scale with us, where God is at the very top of the scale, the best it possibly is, and then we can have like a question about goodness. So what's good? I can have a really good dog, I might have a good car, and I have a good person, and we can think about what makes them good or what's right about that, and we can kind of grade things on a scale. Then we say all the way at the top, there's God. He's the most good, the absolute perfection of good. He's, nothing could surpass him. Well, what's wrong with that way of talking? He's on the same scale. It doesn't matter what superlatives you put on it. If you're using superlatives, he's still on the same scale. And so the reality is you've got to just break this whole thing and say one scale stops and another one starts. And in between, there's this huge void, which is the reality of the difference between God's godness and our creativeness. And there's a world of difference there. So you can never talk about God as being the most anything and be absolutely confident you know what you're talking about. All right, that's the point. Now, second thing that comes into here is this. If we start thinking about God as the peak, then God starts becoming a player in our world with work to do. In other words, he's got things to do. And he becomes this sort of God of the gaps. He does the gravity thing for Newton, who can't figure that out. Or he creates the world, because we don't know where things came from. But then along comes Darwin and says, well, no, God didn't do it. It happened this way. And then what happens to God's face? Uh-oh, starts getting a little smaller. Starts getting a little smaller. And as the scientific world gets more and more answers to more and more things, God's face gets smaller and smaller. So what does the church do in reaction to that? We've got to open God's space back up. We've got to, we've got to save God from the scientific inroads. And now you start getting theology versus science which is stupid, but it happens. And it's being perpetuated by the people inside the church trying to defend God and fight for God's place and fight for God's truth. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not very interested in creation science. To make, put a fine point on this and be really blunt. And maybe you guys get all excited about those books and maybe you've been to the Cincinnati Museum and it's like your Mecca. Oh, the Creation Science Museum. And I know people who make field trips down there, it's like, wow. So cool. Look at all this stuff. Now, hear me on this. Creation science could be making some truth points, and they could be right about some things. But what's the point? Are we really fighting to try to preserve God's place in the world so that we can make sure that he doesn't get pushed out by the scientific things going on? See, the whole premise of that kind of thinking is a zero-sum game again. God's got his part, and the creation has its part, and if creation starts doing too much, then God's part's getting too small. Can't let that happen. God get God's place open up again some more. When in fact, the right way to say is, wait, God's God, he does what he does, and he's operating, and it's all his work, regardless what we see going on and what other things happen. Now, this does not mean I'm trying to make a, a carte blanche for all Darwinian evolutionary stuff, because that's 
often very wrong-headed, and there are huge problems on that, which we'll get to in a few weeks. So we're getting there, but not yet. The point today is to recognize that that very enterprise of trying to make God look all right and trying to save things for Him is kind of a wrong-headed idea to start with. Why are we so worked up about this? And why do we have to say everything was the cause of the flood? Grand Canyon flood, um, you know, everything. <laughs> flood, 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 flood. You know, it just covers it all. And it starts to sound kind of, well, silly, to be honest. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But we don't need to be wrapped up in this stuff. You see, that's another example of the kind of the fundamentalism that starts to grab hold of us. And that's this modernist, <coughs> fundamentalistic sort of thinking. And we begin to think it really matters when it probably doesn't matter that much, really. Okay? With me on this or not? You get what I'm saying? You know, it sounds like heretical stuff. You know, like, <laughs> ooh. All right, point two. The effort to make God and God's agency comprehensible also leads to thinking about the relation of God to human freedom and responsibility as a zero-sum game. All right, we've been down that road, got that all worked through. Then finally, th point three on 182. Theologians who think of God as one thing in the world alongside others often then try to preserve some sense of divine transcendence by emphasizing that God is the most distant, most powerful thing in the world at the peak of all the world's hierarchies. This often makes God the enemy of transformative justice. And then we have all these other problems. And now he starts getting some of his feminist stuff. All right, so you're getting the idea. We miss God, and then we miss what God is doing when we, when we have these things shrunk down way too much. All right, now, the really significant part of this chapter, and I want to cut to this, is page 187. And this whole idea of the role of narrative, and he gets this so right. And coming off the symposium just a week or two ago, it should all be right here for you guys. So I'm being optimistic. Best construction again. He talks about how a good narrative actually creates characters and builds character. And you know how this works. Good storytelling doesn't have a paragraph to say, my character is strong and courageous and loving, and you need to know that about him. No, instead you spend several pages reading about him doing stuff, and you come to realize this is the way this guy is. And so the narrative itself creates the character. Narrative is powerful. And so he's arguing here that the narrative of God's work in the world gives us information about his character, his person, and it does. All right, now, this gets to the most impressive thing of all, those page 189, top of the page. The biblical narratives, however, neither offer to fit into a framework already constructed by experience and historical reflection, nor do they stand aside in a secondary world. Rather, they claim to define the framework within which we might understand our experience and the rest of history. These stories, they say, are what the world is really about, and your own story and the other stories you know can be properly understood only if you fit them into these stories. So that in George Lindbeck's phrase, it is the text, so to speak, which absorbs the world rather than the world the text. Do you get that? This is so cool. It's not as if the world exists and has all this significance, and then we try to figure out how to fit God into that. It's not as if I have my life, and then try to figure out how to fit God into my life, or try to figure out where the church fits into my life. Instead, instead of the world absorbing the text, the text being the narrative, the story of God's action in Christ, instead of the world absorbing that, it's quite the other way around. There is the story, the text, which is creation, redemption, consummation, the whole thing. There's that story, and then the world fits into that. This is enormously significant for how we even think about the church and mission and the work of the church, and what the church should be doing and not doing. When people go church shopping, looking for a church, what are they doing? They're trying to fit the story into their world. Instead, they should be trying to, we should be teaching them how they need to say, hey, there's this reality, God's story, how do I fit into that story? What do I need to do to change, to fit into that story? And yet, what we see the church doing all the time is falling over itself, trying to figure out how to make itself more accommodating to the world, so the world can fit it in. It's completely backwards. It's all upside down. Hey, can I, ask, um, I can see that being used to say, well, this story begins on six days of creation. So mm. whatever this world thing is, it's got to fit in my little six-day paradigm. So I can see that reinforcing the kind of fundamentalism which tries to break 
experience right. in order to fit it into this narrative as they understand it. Right. And so what we have to say is that this narrative is bigger than even you know the, our interpretation of the text themselves. So the narrative is God's actual work. So when I'm talking about the text or even what you know Fry's talking about or Fry or Lindbeck are talking about the text, it's 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 these texts that we've been given, but these texts are normative of this wider narrative. But you've got it. You're right. We can try to say, well, see, I know I've got this right, and so everything has to now be shoved into that. And we'll hit, hit that more when we get to the creation stuff here in a couple of weeks, when you read um, Lennox and a couple of these other guys. All right. Good. Question. Yes, Dan. I'm a lifelong Lutheran, and I'm, I'm hearing a lot of this stuff for the first time. I'm not surprised. <laughs> can, I mean. How on earth are you going to bring this to our churches? You're going to do it. Uh, <laughs> how on earth? You're going to do it gently, and you're going to do it carefully, and you're going to do it much the way I've done it, but you just do it slower and nicer. <laughs> and, um, but no, and it kind of gets back to the question that was asked before, you know, that, um, that how, do we do, how do we do evangelism with this? How do, how do we approach this? You know, how do you, how do you have that conversation? And I think it's the same way. You want to tell people, you know, what is the foundation of your faith? It's Christ. And where did Christ claim you? He claimed it at the baptismal font. These things are real. And this is what it's all about. And you start pointing people to this, this understanding. And then this idea that God's story is the normative thing. And we're not here just kind of peddling church, trying to give people a little meaning in their life or give them somewhere to go before brunch on Sunday morning. You know, so they can get all dressed up and it feels kind of fun. You know, this is the reality that God has given us. This is the truth because this is what God has given us. And we need to conform to that truth and live our lives into that truth. <laughs> Or, or we're just wasting our time. And so you're right. These are often wild, crazy thoughts. But you need to just start teaching them and, and do it with persistence and consistency and, and living it. And people start to get it. It takes time. I highly recommend that you don't do this quickly. Well, yeah, don't do it all at once. Without a lot of background yeah. explanation, people get really offended and more worked up, yeah. Nate. So I worry about trying to do that directly and maybe indirectly would be better. No, don't, don't worry so much. You guys don't, don't worry over much about this. Part of this becomes you need to earn your, your credibility. And so you need to be invested in these people. You need to care about them. You need to be preaching faithfully. But you don't shy away from talking about the, God's full truth. And getting a narrative foundation, which is what the symposium was all about, is part of that foundation and learning to see it that way and learning to talk that way and so every sermon you preach starts to kind of sound this way people are going to realize there's an emphasis here which I'm starting to pick up and this is right and so that's kind of what I get maybe that seems indirect to you but see, to me that's kind of like just hitting it as it needs to be that's what I, I would I would think that, that reforming the way you talk about it they're right. directly saying, stop trusting the Bible first. Yeah, right, yeah. That. Like, that's probably not the really best way. way to get along. Yeah, you don't have a Bible class saying the Bible doesn't matter. You don't do that. You know. <laughs> that's probably not a good way to start. All right, yes. It's a practical situation. If you're in a team ministry situation and you yeah. have a, a senior pastor who doesn't think as what we're uh -huh. talking about, how do you... Systems recommend? 4, we'll deal with that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Always ask for the answer for that. I've got an answer for everybody. What are you saying, <laughs> Yeah. No, you, you, well, you'll have to deal with some of that. And, that, and that's part of, as, as, a, as a reality that you might have to face. And you just have to be patient and we're, have those conversations one on one. Would this then be a, kind of a starting point for preaching narratively as opposed to like using scriptural reference? With uh, narrative preaching, in my opinion, has less to do with telling stories than it does with making sure you're still preaching within the overall narrative. Well, right. So, yeah, and that should be guiding what you do as you preach. So whatever you're doing, even, you know, textual preaching, which you better be doing, means you're following an actual text, is in the context of the wider narrative, and you never lose sight of that. Yeah. All right, good. Anything else on this chapter? The point is that God is the one who is acting through all these things, and we recognize this, and we don't minimize what's going on here. Page 198 at the bottom is where he sounds so terribly Lutheran. It's just remarkable. Very bottom of the page, no one, Paul wrote, can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Not only can we not find God on our own, but even our response to God's self-revelation is God's work. Wow. How much Lutheran, how more, I mean, he's saying that even our ability to say yes, God gives us. That's Luther in spades. That's the um, third article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, but the Holy Spirit calls me. Lindbeck's saying it. 
Good grief, he's right on track here. It's, it's good. All right, now what brings us then to the scriptures? The scriptures resonate with our reality. Things click. The story they tell is God's story. And we begin to see our lives in light of that story, and things start to resonate, and things work. And that's what he's describing on 199. There's this, there's this, ring, there's this truth that rings true here, and there's this sense of resonance with reality, which is quite, quite remarkable. All right, anything else on chapter 11? All right, the final chapter is, almost makes the whole book worthwhile, I think. It's, and on its own, it just stands beautiful. And it's, it's really worthy of a full Bible study that you do hit straight on. And this is the whole question of theodicy. Now, <clears throat> this has some significance for the paper you're going to be writing coming up, so pay attention to a couple things I want to say here. Theodicy is a word which literally means to justify God. Just look at that from the Greek. You can see the Greek roots here. Theos de so to justify God. So theodicy is not so much a way of thinking, even though it becomes that, but we can actually talk about a theodicy. And so a theodicy is an attempt and an effort to try to justify God. So if I give some kind of explanation, well, your four-year-old child was killed in a car accident. That's really sad. Well, here's why this happened. God did this so that you could witness to all the hospital staff. God did this so that people could care for you. And he started giving all these reasons. That's a theodicy. That's a theodicy. It's an attempt to explain things to make God look good. That's a theodicy. And so there are lots of ways of doing this. There are lots of theodicies possible. All right? But any time you make an effort to try to give an explanation which is rational and reasonable, modernist, that's doing a theodicy. Okay? Now, the reason this matters is because this comes up against these three propositions with which Plaker begins, and he's going all the way back to Hume and even further back to Epicurus to these three things. God is good. God, well, first, God is omnipotent. And then evil exists. This is the Achilles heel of, of Christian faith. If you want to make a Christian look like an idiot, just push him on this. So God is omnipotent. Yes, he is. I'm glad you're listening. You're paying attention. And God is good. He loves us profoundly. Well, then why are millions of little kids starving and dying in Africa? Why would a good um, I'm all-powerful God. Let that happen. You're hooked. You're nailed. You're, you're cooked. And so what's your response? <gasps> Here comes a theodicy. And that's what you're going to do. Almost every time. You're going to give them some kind of theodicy. You're going to say something like, well, God knows that these give us opportunity to do good. Um, we can't see the end result. And here's the sermon story this morning. We don't know the end result, so who knows? In the end, maybe it was really a good thing. Who knows? We'll see. And you see, that's a theodicy. It's an attempt to say, well, we just, we just have to see. You know, and, and, or God's letting us show love through this. And These are theodicies. Now, what Plaker's point is in this chapter is that before the 17th century or the 16th century, nobody did theodicies. Nobody. When faced with these big questions about evil or problems, what they would simply say is, yeah, this stuff happens. But God is still omnipotent, and God is still good, and these evil things happen. How does this work? I don't know. <laughs> I can't give an explanation, and I won't try. The effort to give an explanation is a theodicy and is always a bad idea. Well, almost always a bad idea. In some contexts, there's a place for it to a point. We have to be so careful with this stuff, so careful. Because, see, every theodicy has to attack this on some level. So let's just see how this works out. You only have three variables, you only have three things you can mess with. So my theodicy has to attack one of these three points. So one point is to say, well, you know, we have to understand that God is working on his God stuff. And we've got to just cut him some slack. Things sometimes happen beyond his control, and, and he, he allows man to have free will. And so because he's given man free will, he's got to just back off a little bit. And so do you have an omnipotent God anymore? No. You've just compromised God's omnipotence. Now you have a less than all-powerful God, which is a problem scripturally. And a problem theologically. Joel? Yeah, you do. All right. So that's one option. How popular is that option? Pretty popular in the wider culture. You hear it quite a bit. All right, next one. God's really not good. He's all powerful. He doesn't give a rip. You know? 
So millions of kids die, whatever. You know, he's not really paying attention. It doesn't matter to him. And now we're kind of into Aristotle's unmoved mover. And he's omnipotent, but good now. Not really. So what's our problem there? Well, again, Scripture says otherwise. And most people don't like this option because they like a nice grandfather in the sky. And this isn't very popular. But that's one possibility. So then, if neither one of these are very good, we're left with only one last option. Evil ex doesn't exist. And you might think, oh, yeah, that's Christian scientist, Mary, Take, Mary Baker Eddy, who says you don't really have pain. You just think you do. And evil is a non-thing, so it doesn't really exist. And even Augustine played with this a little bit. Now, the problem here is that but wait a minute, these bad things happen. I'm convinced, though, that this is still probably a very popular move because what we end up doing is we're saying, you thought it was bad, but really it was good. God has good intentions. You just have to, and, and you think it was bad, it's the silver lining myth. You know, there's this little dark cloud of you, but there's a silver lining and it's going to be good, and you're going to realize that someday that was a really good thing. Now, the, the kind of horror of this becomes more clear when you think about trying to tell that to parents who have just lost a four-year-old in a car accident. Well, you think this is bad, it's going to be good. This is a really good, good thing. And someday, you're going to look back and say, I'm so glad that our four-year-old was killed. Yeah, you think about how horrible that is, but that's exactly what these boil down to. And now you begin to see the absolute absurdity of doing a theodicy because you end up saying stuff that isn't true and that misleads and doesn't give comfort at all. And this is where Plaker is spot on with his argument. Because what does he say we do? In the face of these, this challenge, what do we, we do? He gives, he gives three points, which I think are really helpful. And let me get the page here for you. <clears throat> yep, 205, 206. Very bottom of 205. He says three things we can do. First thing is you acknowledge that reflection on evil calls attention to what is the brokenness of all theological utterance. And then he says this, We trust that our talk as Christians makes sense in a way that we do not yet see, so there are things we are willing to leave unexplained. We just tell the story. Second, we don't think about evil in relation to an abstract God, but with reference to the triune God in the context of the cross. So in other words, we point people to Christ. That, I don't know why this happened. And I'm not going to offer an explanation, but what I do know is God does care, and he's proven that in Christ. And Christ has come, and he has died, and he has been raised, and he's coming again, and he will put things right. And in the meantime, we just have to trust him. That's what you say. Third thing, earlier responses to these questions were rhetorical, and this gets to Kolb's point. That is, they address the particular concerns of victims in particular situations. You don't try to give sweeping things that cover every situation. You deal with this one problem, this one situation. And sometimes you might actually be able to see something good come of it, but you don't always. And, you, and the point is this. Yes, God makes good things happen out of horrible things. He does this routinely. This is God's forte. Satan brings some kind of horrible suffering, some evil, and what does God do? Say, whatever. I can deal with this. And he makes this work for his good purposes. But does that mitigate the evil? No. Not in the least. And it doesn't redefine it as good. It's still evil, even though God brings something positive from it, which God can do. But we need to call the evil thing evil. So when you go into the emergency room and seek to give counsel, you don't try to offer a theodicy. You don't try to explain things so they understand. All you do is you say things like, hey, let me tell you the reality. This stinks, and I don't know why God would let this happen. It did, and it's a horrible thing. But God hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't quit. Christ is still very much alive, and let's hang on to his promises. That's what you do. And I'll tell you from hard, real-life experience, it's profoundly effective. And that's what ministers to people who are looking for God's comfort in that and not neat little answers that are misleading. Joel? Is this kind of, so does evil kind of fall into the same lines of tentatio? It pushes us towards God? It can, exactly. This is what Luther would say. And so, and so evil has this. And that's why you know, Satan brings his worst and God just brings it for his purposes. But it's still an evil thing. So in other words, we don't say, oh, tentatio is great, I love it. No, it stinks, it's horrible. Evil's, <laughs> evil's evil. And that's the point I'm trying to make. And so God's devil is still the devil and what he's doing is wrong and he's going to hell for all of his wrong actions and yet he's God's devil and he... He serves God's purposes in spite of himself. So if you were to look at the story of Job, God sends Satan to go ahead and send Turns him loose. Go, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Go, go for it. And we really don't know why. God, we don't. God, God There's no says, answer given. He says, says, he basically says, I own everything. So exactly. You can't, you can't Chapter 42, God says, okay, Job, shut up. I'm God, you're not. And Job says, okay. And then, End of story. And then, and, but, and then 
Job ends up going on worshiping God. Yes, exactly. And Plaker talks about that too. And actually, who's commended in Job? Job is. And the friends who are doing theodicies are condemned. Job has to offer sacrifice for them to say their tales. <laughs> Stephanie. Another explanation I've heard uh, often for bad things happening is, is just because sin is in the world. We live in a broken world. Yes. Is that, um, it seems like an explanation. Is it one that, that we can offer? I think that you, can, you can say this. We do live in a broken world. Things are messed up. But see, it doesn't really solve the problem. Because if God's omnipotent, why doesn't he fix the broken world? You know, why is he messing around? And then you're stuck again. See, in other words, systematically, you're quite right. We live in a broken world, and that's true, but it doesn't solve the existential problem. Well, then why doesn't God do something about it if he's really all-powerful? Okay. okay? But you're on the right track. Yep. Nate. How does this change when you're not addressing the mother who just lost her child, but the college student who came back from philosophy 101 and saying, well, you know, there's his argument. How could these possibly be? I mean, is right. it okay to give... Yes, that's what I'm saying. A theodicy is almost always a wrong idea. There's a place for saying, now let's think this thing through. And there are some, you know, Aquinas uh, plays with this, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, in fact, there are some things you can say that, are, that hold some water here. And Timothy Keller does this stuff too in some of his things. So there's a place for that, but it's, it's right. It's in the discussion of a philosophical kind of debate, and there's a place for it there, but not in the middle of the crisis. And you need to know the difference. And I would say, not in a funeral sermon either. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think I think where we've got to do this is in a Bible study, probably soon after you arrive at the church. Probably one of your so, so the people first 52 have, weeks worth, yeah. People have this. Now they're in the emergency room under unemotional, calm situations. You've already put this out there. You always want to teach everything you possibly can when there's no crisis precipitating the issue. Things like church discipline is always easier when it's just a generic idea than when you have Fred who's getting ready to be kicked out. Um, but... You're right. There are, the problem is, the reason I was kind of joking about this, I've, I've got a list of probably about 50 things you should do the first week. Um, so, you know, you're not going to do it all, but you, start, you definitely want to cover these things. I agree with that. Now, the last thing in this chapter, and we're over time and I'll let you get out of here, the last thing is where he makes a really strong point that any attempt to try to explain sin is foolhardy because sin is irrational. It does not have an explanation. And this is a really profound insight and very cool. And we'll pick up this, and the reason I don't need to worry about this too much is because Bonhaver is going to make a similar argument when we get to him when we read Creation and Fall, and so we'll deal with this again. But think about this. Anytime you try to explain sin, you're really mitigating sin because you're making it manageable. You're trying to explain it, and it's a rationalist move. This, this happened because, and as soon as you can say a because and give a reason, it's somehow not as scary anymore. But if sin just happens out of the blue, that's scary. When people just do things for no good reason, when the guy has an affair for no good reason, that's scary because who's exempt? And we don't like that very much. And so we always try to explain it whenever we can. And every attempt is really mitigating and softening sin.